I do. So yes, and Dr. Diesenhaus was a very beloved pediatrician. I don't know whether anybody on the call was uh, at, was, was his patient with your children, but he definitely served so many members of the Toronto Jewish community, but specifically, um, actually, interestingly enough, the Orthodox Jewish community, who, who, who were really uh, very beloved to him, and he was beloved to them. Um, also, I want to wish happy anniversary to my children, Avi and Sonia Diamond, who we are celebrating. 18 wedding anniversary today. I know it's crazy. 18 years. Oh my God. And we're going to have to again try to mute everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, and we had the opportunity to celebrate their third child, Avram Yaakov's bar mitzvah and Shabbos. So a lot of simcha, Baruch Hashem. And I ask that all of you be blessed with simchas and long life and nachas in your lives as well. So let's begin with Parashat Vayetze. I have so many wonderful debates. I think they're wonderful, and I'm hoping you will find it as well. So just to remind everybody the context, the end of Parsha Tolba, of, uh, Yaakov had successfully, and I say successfully, sort of in quotation marks, managed to um, manipulate his father into giving him the brachot and i say manipulate carefully not all the parshanim would say that that was true some of the abortion would say that yitzhak never intended ever ever to give asav the bracha called birka avraham but that was always in yitzhak's mind to give to yaakov but be that as it may it's certainly possible to read the story of last week's parsha so that it seems that rifka had a very strong hand and sort of manipulating Yaakov and controlling the circumstances so that Yitzhak ended up giving a special bracha to Yaakov. But be that as it may, when ya as you know, when Esau discovered what had been done, he decides he's going to kill, he's going to murder his brother for this injustice, this painful theft. And so once this information was conveyed to Rivka in a manner which is unclear, she realizes that the only thing left to do was to urge her son Yaakov to flee. So she convinces uh, her husband Yitzhak that it's unacceptable for Yaakov to stay in town because he needs to get married and he cannot marry a woman from the area. And so he is told by both his father and his mother that he should go back to Rivka's hometown and there find a wife who is suitable for him. And that's the end of Parsha Toldot, and so begins Parsha Vayetze. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. Vayetze Yaakov mi be'er shava vayelech charanam rin from Perik Kavchet, Perik 28, Pasuk Yud. Yaakov, according to the translation, interpretation, Yaakov departed from be'er shava and went to Charan. So, as we mentioned before, through the rabbinic lens, every word, every letter, in the Torah is measured very carefully. And so when we reread this pasuk, by Yetzi Yaakov Mibir Shava, and Yaakov departed from Be'er Shava, and he went to Haram, it seems as though we have two separate sort of verbs describing Yaakov. One is he left and he went. Well, you can't go anywhere without leaving the place that you're in. That means that the word by is redundant. It would have been sufficient basically to say, and Yaakov went to Haran. We know from being careful readers of the text where he is, because those <laughs> details are mentioned throughout the previous parashot. We know where Yaakov was before he left. So all the Torah had to say is he left the Haran. And we get it. We understand the circumstance. I just summarized it for you. But that's not how the parsha begins. The parsha begins by emphasizing not only where he was going, but the act of departure. So that apparent unnecessary word, that redundancy, is what triggers Rashi and some of the other Meforshim to say, well, if it's there, it's there for a reason. And Rashi tells us the following, and it becomes a very well-known Rashi. I'll read it to you. The Torah did not need to tell us that he departed. It only needed to tell us that he went. So why is it, in fact, that the Torah deliberately and intentionally included this verb of departure when only the word would have been sufficient? And Rashi tells us the now famous sort of phrase, 
אלא מגיד שיציאת צדיק מן המקום עושה רושם. Tor wants us to understand that the departure of a righteous person from the place that he lives leaves an impression. Shebizman shat tzaddik ba'ir, because all the time that the righteous person is in the city, hu hoda, hu ziva, hu hadra, that he, the righteous person, somehow contributes to the city. He becomes the majesty, he becomes the glory, he becomes the beauty of the city. Yatsa misham, but once the tzaddik leaves the city, yatsa, Pana Huda, Pana Ziva, Pana Hadra. So that beauty, that somehow spiritual injection that the tzaddik brings to the city is gone. So it's not enough to tell us that simply Yaakov went to Haram, but the Torah wants us to understand that his departure made an impact. It was somehow felt that all the time that he was there, Yaakov, in manner which is not explicitly described in the text, must have been influential in some way beyond just his own tent. And even though he was described at the beginning of the parasha as being Yosheh, well, he was a simple man, simple not in the sort of intellectual sense, but he was a modest man and he was very committed to the notion of intellectual activity and studying Torah. Apparently, whatever he was doing was did not go unnoticed and his departure also didn't go unnoticed and left him an impression. So the Kli Yakar, Rav Ephraim Lunshitz, asks a fascinating question. You read what I just read, you read this Rashi, it sounds like what? You say, it sounds like, oh my God, Yaakov left Be'er Sheva, and the town is bereft of a righteous person. It's, it's as though the, the beauty, the injection of Torah, of spirituality, of elevated living is gone. But the Kliakar says, but whoa, 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 before you get carried away, just remember the details of the story. Remember what we said? We said Yaakov had to leave because he was fleeing from his brother Esau. But who did he leave behind? Well, he left behind his parents. His parents were Yitzhak and Rivka. So maybe it's true that Yaakov left town, but the town is not bereft of Tzadiki. The town is left with having the two pretty astounding and influential personalities of Yitzchak and Rivka still living in Beersheba. So why is it that there's this sort of impression left, oh my God, Yaakov is leaving and somehow the city is now diminished in its greatness. Well, two great individuals are remaining there. So that's a question that the Kli Yakar attempts to answer. And his answer is a quantitative answer. And he says, it's true that Yitzchak and Rivka remained in town. But the impact of two tzaddikim as opposed to three tzaddikim is not the same. That there really is, as the saying goes, strength in numbers. And even though Rivka and, and, and uh, Yitzchak did remain in Beersheba, Yaakov's uh, absence was noticed. And you can say, oh, nobody's going to notice three tzaddikim, two tzaddikim. Oh, man. No, it was noticed. Whatever it was that Yaakov was able to do, people missed him. And it seems from this Midrash, that even though Yitzchak and Rivka remained, things weren't the same. So that's the Kliyakar's explanation, which, as I said, it's more of a, it, it does have more of a quantitative emphasis to it. Three is better than two. But there's another explanation offered by a much more contemporary rabbi, Rabbi Druk. He, in 2015, <clears throat> Rabbi Druk, who's a, a rabbi in, in uh, New York, uh, in a sefer that he wrote with his thoughts on the parsha called Eish Tamim, offers a different sort of explanation. And it's not so much numeric. It's just exactly the opposite. And he says, it's true that Yitzhak and Rivka remained back in Beersheba, but it's also true that not everybody's the same. And if you look at things quantitatively, you may think that the reduction from three to two is not such a critical reduction. But maybe that's not the lens to look at this and understand what Rashi is saying. Maybe the proper lens is to understand that even if Rivka and even if Yitzhak remain, their particular spiritual impression and the work that they did reflected their life experience. Clearly, we all reflect our life experience. But Yaakov's was different. And even if Yitzhak and Rivka remained, it's not about three being reduced to two. It's that whatever specific imprint that Yaakov had because of his personality, because of his own connection, because of the way in which he taught and connected to people, that was gone. That's what was missed. 
And it's not about the numbers. It's about the fact that all of us, I think, have our own personal, I guess, peculiarities or strengths, how should we say it? And yes, even in a crowd of 50 or 100, if one of us leaves, now who can tell between 100 and 99 or between three to two? The answer is, that's not the case. We can. Each of us makes an impression. All of us work in certain circles. All of us have the people we connect to. And if one of us was missing, then one of us is missing. And in a sort of a midrashic homiletic sense, of course, that's true as the Baal Shem Tov taught about a Sefer Torah. So a Sefer Torah is filled with thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of letters. Okay, so one letter is missing. Does it really make a difference? And the answer is 100% it makes a difference. One letter is, one letter is missing from a Sefer Torah. The entire Sefer Torah is puzzle. And he says it's the same thing from one of us. Every neshama that comes to the world is a neshama that bears some sort of specific role. That's why God created that neshama, and that's why Hashem sent the neshama. So just as because there may be hundreds of thousands of people populating a community, who cares if one's missing? Well, Hashem lives, of course one cares, because whatever that one person brought, with, in whatever capacity he or she brought it, is no longer there. There's a diminishment. There's a diminishment of the presence of God through that neshama. And so according to the Eish Tamid, Rabbi Druk, that's what this is about. Don't think that all the other, we, we lump them together. They're, of course they're together, but each had their own specific way of bringing an understanding and a connection to God, to the community in which they live. And so every one of us, it, although we may not be patriarchs in that sense, and we may not be the center of Jewish life in the communities, or maybe you are, but all of us bring something that no one else can bring. There's nobody else who can be you, and there's nobody else who can be me. And what is what makes you you is what would be missed. Chas v'shalom, we no longer are here. So that's the first of our Torah based on the Rashi of Vayetze. Okay, so let's just go a little bit more. So Yaakov does leave, and he starts on this journey. And he's leaving on his journey, and obviously there's probably a lot of dread, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. So the Torah tells us that as he's going on his journey, he reaches a place and nightfall uh, comes upon him and he realizes that he needs to sleep, he needs to rest, he's not going to walk in the night. By Gaba Makom, he encounters the place, the place, and he goes to bed, goes to sleep. And it's during this sleep that he has this extraordinary vision, now very, very famous of the ladder and angels going up, angels going down. And during this encounter, he somehow has a prophetic encounter in which Hashem speaks to him. And I want to read what Hashem says. Vayomer, Vayomar, excuse me. And Hashem says to Yaakov, Ani Hashem, Elokei Avraham Avicha, Elokei Yitzchak, Haaretz Asher Ata Shocheva Leha Lecha Et Nena Ulezarecha. I'll read the English. I am Hashem, God of Abraham, your father, and God of Yitzchak, the ground upon which you are lying. To you will I give it, and to your descendants. Your offspring shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out powerfully westward, eastward, northward, southward. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and by your offspring. Behold, I, is the Shem speaking, I am with you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will return you to this soil. For I will not forsake you until I will have done what I have spoken about you. Wow, what, a, what an unbelievable promise. First of all, the encounter, when Hashem gives him the lamb and says to him, I know you're leaving Israel, which he was. He was going out to back to where Rachel, uh, where Rivka came from, but then around. And Hashem says, I'm going, you're going out of the country, but I promise you, I will be with you. I will not let you be alone. I will watch over you, and I will stay with you. 
until I bring you back to this land and until I fulfill all my promises. Oh my goodness. If only Hashem would be appear to us in such clarity and say these things to us. So now listen to this. I'm going to again read a little bit more. Vaikatsi Yaakov Mishnato, and Yaakov wakes up and he says, Achain Yesh Hashem Bamakom Hazeba Nachi Lo Yadati. Hashem is present in this place, and I, I didn't know it. Vayira Vayomar Mano Raha Makom Hazeb, Einze Ki Im Beit Elokim Bezesh Ar Hashemayim. And he gets agitated because he realizes he's somehow in a great holy place and he, he, he sort of missed it. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the abode of God and this is the gate of the heavens. And Yaakov got up early in the morning. He wakes up in the morning, makes an altar, makes a matzeva. And then listen to this. I'm skipping the verse. And then Yaakov took a vow. Took a vow. And this is what he says. If God will be with me, will guard me on this way that I am going, will give me bread to eat, clothes to wear, and I return in peace to my father's house, and Hashem will be a God to me. Then this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall become a house of God. And whatever you will give me, I shall uh, repeatedly tithe to you. I will give you Maser. So let, let's stop here. The words that I'd like us to just focus on for a little bit now is the part at the end. So he's taking the vow. So when you read the vow, what's the vow saying? Well, what, what's, what's Yaakov taking a vow? It sounds like, it sounds like that Yaakov is saying, well, God, if you do all the things that you just promised me, then you know what? I promise you something. Hashem li then Hashem, you will become my God. That's what Bahaya Hashem li lenukim. And Hashem will be a God to me. So if you read this just simply, the text in the plain meaning that seems to arise from the text, it sounds really like Yaakov is entering into an agreement. You know, I'm not buying this entirely, Hashem. For me to sort of become your loyal servant, you got to do certain things first. What? It, it, it takes on a tone that's a little bit disturbing. It leaves me unsettled that Yaakov Avinu, our forefather, is entering into some sort of bargaining of, you do this for me, God, and then, then I'll consider maybe making you a divinity in my life. So that's a difficult question. It's a difficult question, first of all, because just beforehand, Hashem explicitly said all of these things. So what is Yaakov saying? I don't believe you. Hashem said, I'm doing this, A, B, C, D. And then Yaakov takes a nether and says, if you do A, B, C, D, then you'll be my God. You, don't, you, did, you didn't believe the things that Hashem just told you? What does it mean by Yashem Lilokim? So I want to share with you two classical interpretations. The first is Rashi. And the first is Rambam, and, and the second is Rambam. Now, we're not going to go through all the different parts of Rashi, but when it comes to these provocative words, Vahaya Hashem Lile Lokim, Rashi uh, offers an interpretation that I think is important. And just to sort of sum it up without reading it all on the side, when you read it, it's important to understand what this nether means. And Rashi says it is a mistake. It is an error to think that the words Vahaya Hashem Lilelukim are a conditional phrase where if you do this on condition, God, that you do this, then this will be the result. That's not the way to understand what Yaakov is saying to God. What God, what, Av, what Yaakov is saying to Hashem, according to Rashi, and I'll read this part because I think it's important. Vahaya Hashem li lelukim, and Hashem will be a God for me. That's the last four words. Rashi says, Sheachol Shmo Alai Mikila Vatso, that God somehow allows his holy name to rest upon me from beginning to end. Shiloi Matsei Psul Bazari, that there be no defect in my children, in my descendants. In other words, to use more modern language, that none of my kids would go off the derrick. 
So what Rashi is saying is this. He's not saying, if you do this, this will be the consequence and I'll, this is the condition. He's saying something else. What Rashi is saying is, Shem, look, you want me to be your servant and to be fully, um, you want me to dedicate my life. I want to do that, but I need your help. Not it's a condition, but for me to do the things that you want me to do, you need to protect me. You need to create those conditions in which the Hayashem Lila Lukim doesn't mean you will be my God, me personally. It will be my, the God that is part of my family. You know, sometimes when we talk about ourselves um, and we talk about our children, you know, we, we talk about my, they, they're mine. My, but it's not just me. It's, it, it's a, the royal me that involves a whole large group. It's not just I will be your faithful servant, all of us. For us to be your faithful servants, for all of us not to be off the derech, God, I need your help. Because I can't do it all by myself. Look what you're go look where I'm going. I'm going far away. I'm leaving my father's home. I'm leaving the yeshiva. I'm leaving my tent. I'm leaving my mother and my father. I'm leaving the Navi. I'm going, I don't know where I'm going. I'm going somewhere far away. I'm a little bit worried what's gonna happen. I'm supposed to find a wife. I'm supposed to start a family. But I don't know what's gonna be. I want to be fully invested. I want every one of my children not to go off the derech. And so that's what he says. And he's not saying, ah, oh, you got to do this for me. Otherwise, I'm out of here. That's not it. Rashi says it's quite the opposite. He's recognizing the, the threats and the danger that exists. And he's pleading with Hashem, please, for me to be entirely unblemished, I need your help. Which I have to tell you, and I'm looking, I know that there's a lot of different people in this group. Uh, some are parents, some are grandparents, not everybody may be a parent, but everybody is the son of, or daughter of somebody. You don't think that our parents had dreams and probably had conversations with God about, please do this for my kid, or please watch over my children. It's almost like Yaakov is living in the 21st century, where there's so many things that could go wrong, and so many influences that can pull our children away from the traditional lifestyle that maybe we've tried to teach them and we've invested and maybe we went to school and they went to school, but you and I both know there are zero guarantees about anything, about anything. And for certain, not, not about children or even grandchildren's connection to Hashem and Yiddishkeit and God. And Yaakov is saying exactly that. He says, I don't want there to be any sort of problem with my descendants. I don't want any of my children to turn their back and to walk away from Torah and to walk away from Yiddishkeit. I don't want that, but I need your help because I can't do this by myself. And as much as, as I said, and I, you know this from those of you who join me in my shiurim, this is almost not a story about Yaakov anymore. This is a story about us. At least, you know, that, that's how I sometimes feel. And I work in the school. So you know that I, I see I see all the things that can happen to children at a young age, at an older age. It's not simple. It's not simple. It's not a push it world up there. And I, I read this this Rashi and I'm thinking that is exactly the tefillah that so many of us would be saying to Hashem. Please, Hashem, for us to be right there with you, we need your help. That's Rashi. The Ramban takes this in a completely, completely different way. Um, also, in some ways, provocative. And he takes a different spin on it. So when the Ramban hears the words, Bahaya Hashem li lelukim, he's not talking about, as Rashi is, please watch over my kids so they don't fall off the derrick. But he's saying something else. He's saying, I know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I, if you have an English copy of the Ramban at home, or if you're capable of working through the text yourself in Hebrew, it, it's quite, I think, uh, worthwhile to, to try to see it in, in the language. What the Ramban says is this, I'm leaving Israel, and I will do my best, says Yaakov, to maintain whatever semblance of 
observance existed at that time. But I know that living outside of Israel is a diminished reality. And the only time, says Yaakov, the only time that I can actually say the Hayah Hashem Lili Yoki, that Hashem will be that complete God and that the connection to Hashem will be complete as described in these four biblical words, the Hayah Hashem Li Lelokim, says the Ramban, it only happens in Israel. It only happens in Israel. That even, we all know there's so many mitzvot that we do that are not dependent on being in Israel. Like Shemitah, that was obviously dependent on being in Israel. And building a Beit HaMikdash only depend, depends entirely on being in Israel. But Shabbos doesn't, Mezuzah doesn't, Tefillin doesn't, Kashrut doesn't. All of these laws are, are mitzvahs that apply to you wherever you happen to be. But the Ramban is positing a theory. And his theory is that as much as you can be entirely careful and observant to the nth degree, no matter where you live, your, your home is totally kosher, and you're, you're, there's not a question about Shabbos, the Shabbos in your home. Ramban is saying, understand this, that the nature of your Jewish life is not complete. The only place on earth in, in which you can lead the fullest, most complete and all embracing manner of Torah observance, the only place is in the land of Israel. Of course, Ramban made that true in his own life. As you know, later in life, he made Aliyah. And he settled in Yerushalayim, and he settled in the Iratika, the old city. And of course, those of you who've been to Israel have been blessed with the opportunity know that he started a shul in the old city. The Ramban shul was the shul that he started because he deeply believed in this idea. And it's an interesting idea because, again, in my mind, at least for me, this is also a contemporary message. Life is good. Life is good in many places in the world. Life is good in Toronto. Life is good in Borough Park. Life is good in, in other places as well. You say, it's, it's a machaya. You can get anything you want. You can go get kosher pizza. I live not far. Kosher bread, mikvah, school, shuls. It's a machaya. We can get everything we want. The problem is, this isn't where we were belong. This isn't where Hashem intended for us to live. In fact, the Gemara takes it one step further and makes a really bold, very provocative sentence. Hadar michutz la'aretz. Which means a person who lives outside of Israel, he has no God. Now, it doesn't mean that you and I are idolaters. But I think what the Gemara is saying is, if you really do believe in the fullness of God, your deliberate choice not to live in Israel, where the fullness of Torah can be observed, must be that there's something about you that's okay with God not being entirely embraced and full. So if that's a decision you and I are making, and I'm going to speak about me because I'm living here. I live at Bathurst and Lawrence, and many of you are tuning in. You're not, maybe somebody is living in Israel, but for those who are not, so we're making a conscious decision, and I know we all have reasons. I get it. I get it. There's this reason, that reason, family reason, monetary, okay, whatever it is, but it's a reason. It's a reason. We're here. There are other people who have chosen to take on that fight and to make, move to Israel and to struggle with whatever it is, and we got it. But for those of us, me, for, who have made a deliberate conscious decision, we're not going to take on that struggle. According to the Ramban, you're making a statement about the way in which you're, you're relating to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're okay. We're okay. I'm okay with sort of like that diminished embrace. And the Ramban says, that's what Yaakov is saying. On the verge of leaving Israel, He's aware. He gets it. He understands that the fullness of Jewish life, as full as it can be, where in, in, in Bathurst and Lawrence, which I jokingly call the Geula section of Toronto, as much as it is, and I got all these little shtiblach around me, it's not the same. It's not. And for those who have been to Israel, you get off the plane and somehow you feel it, don't you? I, I do. You feel something is different. and. Food is different. Davening is different. And Birkat Kohanim is different. And walking down the street is different. Why is it different? It's different because it's Israel. It's because it's Eretz Israel. Because that's where, that's where it is. So according to the Ramban, that is exactly what it was intended by 
these words of Vashem Yali Lelokim. Interesting take, Rashi's take, and um, the Ramban's take. It's not, I wasn't intending it to be a prosine speech, but I don't think we can ignore the Ramban. And especially, honestly, for those of you who are following, I guess, the unfolding of the, the anti-Semitic rise in so many parts of the world, you wonder, hmm, you know, maybe Ramban's message is resonating in a different way than he might have intended it, but it seems to have a contemporary feel to it. But amongst the other things mentioned here, I want to share yet another fascinating idea with you. So when Hashem promises to Yaakov Avinu what he's going to do for him, I want to read this part again. So I'm reading now for those who have a Chumash. You don't have to have a Chumash, as you know. I'm reading from Eric Kapeb 28, Pasuk Yud Dalit. So one more time, this is what, this is what Hashem says to Yaakov. Vahaya zaracha ka'afar ha'aretz. And your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread out powerfully westward, eastward, northward, and southward. And now I want, listen carefully to the next words. I'm reading from the, stone, from the art scroll stone from us, and the translation here is this. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and by your offspring. V'nivrechu v'cha. V'nivrechu, the stone translation says, they shall bless themselves by you. So the intention seems to be that you're going to be a source of bracha. The people are going to consider you to be the gold standard of blessing. And when people say, oh, we bless you to have a long life, they're going to be invoking Yaakov's name, the name of his descendants. Blessing. Bracha v'nivrechu v'cha. I want to share with you a fascinating explanation by Rav Shmuel ben Meir, otherwise known as Rosh Bam, who happens to be Rashi's grandson. So Rashi, as you know, as a, um, as a, as a biblical commentary, was very loyal to what's called the Pshat method of interpretation. Pshat means the plain meaning. That Rashi believed that we should try to extract from the Pasuk the plainest meaning possible. His grandson was even more committed to it than Rashi was. And so when you take a look at Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, you sometimes find that he's far more literal than his grandfather was. Rashi does seek out the plain text, but the Rashbam is even more literal than that and sometimes sees the literal meaning more than just the plain meaning, which often takes into account context. So I want to read to you what the Rosh Bam says about what you and I take for granted is what B'nai Rehu means. Now, we thought B'nai Rehu meant to bless. Listen to this. B'nai Rehu l'shon mavrir umarki. So I'm going to explain. The word Nivrahu has a shorish, a root word. The three letters of the root word of B'nai Rehu is bet, resh, tav. B'nai Rehu, bless. But the Rashbam says, yes, but those three letters, Beit Reish Chav, also form the root word of a form the root letters of another word. And he mentions a word that is definitely a word more commonly used in rabbinic literature than biblical, but it is a word. And what is it? It's a word that means, it's an agricultural context, grafting. Grafting. Like when you take two species and you graft them together so that they grow in a manner that's connected. The Mishnah, the Sechet Kilayim, in the seventh parak, first Mishnah, Kilayim is that chapter of Mishnah which deals with a lot of agricultural rules and which seeds you can plant together, which seeds you're not allowed to plant together. So there was a technique apparently used by farmers and those who were that growing tree is called Havracha, from the Shorish Bay Reishcha, where you took a branch and you bend it without breaking it, you worked it, you bent it, and then you, as it were, 
implanted the branch, which was still connected to the tree, under the ground. And so doing, it caused the branch to root itself under the ground. So let's go back and understand what Rashbam is thinking when he changes the context of the Nivrahu from blessing, which seems to be the plainest meaning, to the Nivrahu, which means grafting. And I want to read, a, I, I, want, I want to share a fascinating idea here. And part of this is actually um, in, in Rabbi Yeshaya Leibowitz's writings on the Parsha, where he tries to explore this idea. So, v'nivrechu v'cha, one more time, kol mishpachot adama. So, if the context of grafting is the correct context, so what does this mean? And grafted to you will be the other nations of the families of the earth. What does that mean? So, let's just go back for one second. And I want to point out where Yaakov's own family history and trajectory was very different than his father's and his grandfather's. So let's just go back, starting with Avraham. So Avraham, of course, had a wife named was Sarah. Remember the story, Sarah couldn't have a baby. She was barren. So what does Sarah do? Do you remember the story? She brings an Egyptian handmaiden whose name is Agar. And out of a love of Avraham, who had no children, she encourages her husband, Avraham, to have a baby with Agar. That's the mother of Ishmael. Well, what happens to Ishmael? According to the Torah, Sarah realized whatever problem there was, and Avraham ends up sending Ishmael and Hagar away. Ishmael then becomes the father of a great nation, but not an inheritor of Avraham. So Avraham then has a son, Yitzchak. Yitzchak gets married to Rivka, and they have twins. Esau, and they have Yaakov. And what happens? Yaakov ends up, of course, marrying. That's the story in Parshas by Yitzchak. But Esau also ends up marrying, but he ends up marrying, I'll say this, out of the faith, according to the way the Torah describes it. In fact, Yitzchak and Rivka were not so happy about the women he chooses, but according to the Torah, he too has this huge family, which really does not become inheritors of Yitzchak nor of the grandfather, Avraham. And then we get to the story of Yaakov in this week's Parsha. So Yaakov was intended to marry Rachel, Rachel. Then we have the whole subterfuge on the night of the wedding. He ends up marrying Leah. But the Torah also tells us that there's two handmaidens that Yaakov ends up marrying, Bilhah and Zilpah, in addition to Leah and Rachel. And he has children with those kids. And here's where it gets interesting. Whereas Avraham had a child from a handmaiden who was never part of the family. And Yitzchak had a child who was never part of the family. Every one of Yaakov's 12 children, born either of Rachel, Leah and Rachel or of Bilhah and Zilpah, become the progenitors of the Jewish people. That's a big departure. So listen to this idea. It's a fascinating idea. According to the literal sense, this is the idea that uh, the Rosh Vam or the Shmuel of Meir is suggesting, means that the blessing, which would have been the meaning that we read initially, the blessing shall call upon them, but Rosh Vam interpreted this as coming from the idea of grafting a branch onto the trunk of a tree in order to improve the branch and its fruit, or the purpose of grafting, is to give the tree certain characteristics from the grafted branch. So according to this interpretation, according to this interpretation, it's fascinating. The Nivruchu Becha meant that Yaakov was the trunk onto him would be grafted branches of the from the families of the earth, and those would be his descendants. So it's a different it's a different perspective entirely. It's not blessed; it's grafting. It's a description of how Yaakov 
was somehow going to be connected to the wider community of world families. An illustration of this idea appears in the list of Yaakov's descendants. Yaakov included, when Yaakov, before he dies in Parsha by Yechi, he gives bracha to everybody. Yaakov included the sons of Bilha and Zilpah amongst the Shvatim, the Shiftei Ka, the 12 tribes that formed the holy beginnings of the Jewish people. There's no differentiation between them and his other sons. Avraham expelled his, born, his firstborn son, born to Hagar, and Esav did not carry on the line of Yitzchak, but with Yaakov, there's a huge and important fundamental turning point. The sons of the handmaidens, in this case, of course, Bilha and Zilpa, are part of the 12 tribes that become a single piece people, B'nai Israel. And let's go one step further. Do you remember the story of Yosef? Yosef gets sold, correct? He goes to Egypt. By Yeshua, we know the Parshas. He gets married, right? Who does he get married to? Osnat, the daughter of Potiphera. Whoa, 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 whoa. And so he has two kids. Do you remember their names? Ephraim and Menashe. And what does the Torah tell us? That Yaakov gives a bracha. He brings, Yosef says, I want you to bring these kids close to me. And he says, Ephraim and Menashe, Lehem. They're going to be my kids, no less than Reuben and Shimon. What? The kids were born to a woman who was the daughter of the priest of Egypt? Whoa! Yeah, she converted. I get it. I understand that. But what we're seeing here is something with Yaakov that we hadn't seen with Abraham. We hadn't seen with Yitzchak. We see an opportunity or an openness to points of connection to the Mishpachot Ha'adama, the families of the earth. And this message was passed on to his children and the Jewish people in the course of our history. At times, of course, we did connect ourselves and even maybe improve ourselves with aspects of the outside world. And maybe that's perhaps extending the ranks of the Jewish people, beginning with what? Well, Yaakov and Yosef, Ruth, the Moabiah, who becomes the progenitor of David Amelech, ultimately the Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva was considered to be the children of Geri. Unklus, the, every, he's in our Chumash, every Chumash you buy is going to have the translation of Unklus into Aramaic, but Unklus himself was a proselyte. How does that happen? Because he had to, he came from a family that was not part of the Shif Deka. And according to this idea, the Nivrahu Vachas is the Rashbam, that's what it means. At this moment, Yaakov is being told something, not just about his own personal journey, but he's being told something that actually is more of a prophetic vision about the nature of Jewish life throughout all time. That there will be places in which we connect to those who are from outside of the community. Sometimes I think we, as, as Jews, we, we have a little bit myopic vision. We see ourselves as circling the wagons to protect ourselves. But the biblical story itself is that it takes us in a slightly different direction where we see at least an openness. Now, maybe things have changed and the dangers to the Jewish people are more profound. I, I don't know if that's true. I'm not 100% sure. In my opening, you know, the opening Rashi that we learned together, certainly it seems from Rashi that Yaakov would petrify that his children would, would succumb. So whatever that fear that we might have, he seemed to have it too. So I don't know if the biblical era is, is entirely different than the modern era in that sense. But it does, I think, oppose a really interesting, uh, interesting sort of perception. And I'm always amazed, always, always. And I've worked in schools, as, as you know. But I always am amazed at my encounters with families who are on this journey of conversion and who want to be part of the Jewish people. And I wonder whether or not their interest, of course, is, is specific, but whether in some ways it itself is a fulfillment of this prophetic blessing that Hashem said to Yaakov, according to the Rashbam's theory about grafting and that allowing others to connect themselves to us and in so doing, improves them and improves us. Okay.
hoping you're finding this interesting. We're going to move on a little bit. Chapter 29, Kaptet. Vayisa Yaakov Raglav, Vayelech Artsa Bnei Kedem. So the whole story of this dream is now finished, and he gets up, and now he continues his journey. So I want to read that again. Listen very carefully to how the Torah describes Yaakov's journey, or more specifically, how the Torah describes where Yaakov is going. So Yaakov lifted his feet. It's a more poetic, or biblical term to walking. And went toward the land of the Easterners. Did you hear that? Where is he going? He's going to the land of the Easterners. Where was he going before? Well, the beginning of the Parsha, it says, Yaakov in Beersheba. Vayelech, same word, and he went, where was he going? Haran, to Haran. So is he not going to Haran? Yes, he's going to Haran. Of course he's going to Haran because that's where the family is located. So I know that the end point is Haran. Beginning of the Parsha, before this encounter, let's say, Parsha, before this encounter that night, the Torah tells us he's going to Haran. After the encounter, he's going to Artsa Beneket. Same place. But why talk about it in different terms? So, one of the commentaries, the Meshe Chochma, Rabbi Semple Mayor of the city of Dvinsk, in his commentary, Collection of Insights to the Torah, makes the following a suggestion, that when Yaakov began his journey at the very beginning of the Parsha, it was Haran in mind. That, that's, you know, he, he knew where he was going, that's where his mom and dad told him, that's where the Haran got to find a wife, that's where he was going. He had very little or maybe even no expectation of anything helpful or meaningful happening happening anywhere other than the place where family lives. He has to go to Haram. And the journey was just the required obstacle that he had to overcome to get to the destination. I have to go to Haran. I'm in Beersheba. And everything in between is a pain. And I wish, I, you know, oh my God, I got to get, okay, fine. However long it takes, it takes. But it's the destination that's important to me. And that's what he was hoping for. But that perspective changed, apparently, when he woke up the next morning after this pretty intense encounter as a result of this dream and where Hashem says to him, I promise you, do you remember what Hashem says to him? Hashem says to him, Ushmarticha b'chol wherever you go, I will be with you. So now it seems his focus has shifted. He's no longer specifically looking at Haran as the place of refuge and the place of success. When Hashem protects you, every place in some ways can become a potential place of growth, of discovery, and of learning. When you know that you have Hashem protecting you, then the journey can be as significant as the destination. With Hashem's protection accompanying him wherever he went, success can come from any source. He thought it could only be attached to the destination. And now, with God's promise, the journey also becomes important. So sometimes we get stuck on our destination and we don't get it. We don't see that the journey along the way can be equally instructive and can be equally important and can be broadening because we somehow see. It's got to be there. And along the way is a lot of danger. That's probably true. But it seems from the Mesha Chochma, at least for Yaakov Avinu, he was able to see that the journey itself had so much more to teach him. Okay. So that was a quick word. Yaakov finally reaches Haran. And we know the stories, the wedding, first for first to Leah, come back to that in a minute, then to, to uh, Rachel. And then the Torah tells us that he starts to build his family. And in Perakhav Tet, the Sukhwam and Hay, the Torah tells us about all the children that are born. And then um, it tells us about the birth, the first, the first child that's born is called. No, not, excuse me, the first child is Ruvain. 
second child is born, it's called Shimon. The third child is born, it's called Levi. And then the fourth child. Batar od Batele Bain Batomer, so she gets pregnant again, fourth time later. And she becomes pregnant and she has a baby boy, Batomer, and she says, Hapa'am Ode et Hashem. This time, this time she says, Let me gratefully praise Hashem. This time. Al Kain Karashimo Yehuda. And therefore she called the boy's name Yehuda, the word Toda. Thanking, gratefulness, gratitude. But Ta'amod Miladid, and she stopped giving birth. So she's had four children. Four children is extraordinary. Why is it extraordinary? Because there's four women who are giving birth. There's Rachlea, Rachel, Bilhan, and Zilpa. Being a prophetess in her own right, Leah understood that the total number of children was going to be to form the Jewish people was going to be 12. So 12 and 4 adds up to 3. Each one should have 3. But she had 4. She realized, oh my gosh, this is extraordinary. I've been giving this extra blessing. And so she calls the son Yehuda. The Gemara in the Sechet Brachot says something extraordinary and a little bit troubling even. Amar Rabbi Yochanan Mishim Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Rabbi Yochanan quotes Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. It says this, From the day that Hashem created the universe's world, there was never a person who thanked God until Leah came on the scene, our Parsha, and thanked God. As it is said, This time I shall thank God. Now, that's a bold statement Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is saying, because let's just unpack it for a second and consider what he says. So until this point in the Chumash, and there's a whole long list of human beings, of human race, that starts with Sefer with the Parsha and Rashi till now. And according to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, nobody ever thanked God? Nobody? I mean, does that make sense to you? Not his father Yitzchak, not his mother Rivka, not his grandfather Avram, not his grandmother. Sorry. Nobody thank God? Does that sound even potentially possible? So you got to figure out what this Gemara means. Rabbi Shon Bar Yechai is not making this outlandish statement just to be provocative. He's making a deeper statement. But he doesn't explain this deeper statement. So that gives a lot of room for a lot of different ideas. I want to tell you an idea that Rabbi Shalom Mashash, Zichron al Rabbi Shalom Mashash, uh, was a chief rabbi, the Sardic chief rabbi in the city of Yerushalayim for at least 25 years. He died at the age of 90 uh, about seven, eight years ago, maybe a little bit more. But he was a chief rabbi, the Sardic chief rabbi in the city of Yerushalayim. So here's a story that was told about Rabbi uh, Mashash. That he was, um, he was invited once to give a shear in a koilo in Yerushalayim. And he was not a young man. He was, a, he was an older man, and it was hard for him to walk. So he finished his shear in Koilo, and he had taken his, his walking stick, his cane, and he was walking down the stairs of the Beit Midrash, and the Avrechim, the boys and the, the men in the Shiva were, were walking, accompanying him. They're a parents, and they want to ask him questions and listen to him. So he's going down the stairs, and he, the, the cane fell out of his hand and fell to the bottom of the stairwell. And of course, the boys, were, the men, the Abrechim, were very startled by this, and they quickly ran down the stairs. And Rabbi Mashash says, no, no, it's okay, it's okay, I, I can do it. And he walked to the bottom of the stairs. He says, you know, it's, it's okay, I, I'm okay without the cane. So you're okay without the cane. You're okay without the cane, so why the cane? So he says, well, I want to tell you what happened to me. A while ago, um... About 10 years ago, he says, I had a very serious operation and it was really touch and go. And it wasn't clear that I would make it through the operation. Um, but I did. It was successful. In fact, not only was it successful, it exceeded everybody's expectations. And not only that, my recovery was actually startling. and People couldn't believe. And after a few months, uh, in which I had to walk with a cane, but after those few months, I was able to go right back to my myself, and I was feeling strong and very capable, and I didn't need a cane. 
But I decided that I wanted to keep the cane. Why? Because I wanted to keep the cane as a sign to perpetually remind me to be grateful to God for what could have happened and didn't happen. So I don't need the cane. The cane is my sign to always be grateful to Hashem. So it says Rabbi Mashash, that may be shot in what this means. It's not that Leah was the first person in human history to thank God. Of course not. Everybody did. But she took it to step that not everybody did. She might have been the first person to do this, to realize that expressing gratitude had to be a lifelong endeavor. That when Yehuda was born and she had done the math in her head, which was not a difficult math, she realized that she'd been given something that she didn't expect. And so for the rest of her life, she wanted to demonstrate and to express her gratitude for this unbelievable blessing of being the mother of four children who ultimately would become the heads of the Jewish people. And so she called her son Yehuda from the name thank you to always think about the son and to realize he is the incarnation, as it were, of Hashem's extraordinary blessing. And every time she called him Yehuda, she would be mindful of that gratitude. And she was the first one to realize that in some situations, perpetual gratitude is the way in which we have to live. Uh, I'm going to end with another, uh, one more Dvar Torah, short one. And then we'll open up the mic and we can, uh, we can chat a little bit. So amongst the names of the children that <clears throat> uh, she has, one of the sons, I'm going to find the Pasu, is called Yisachar. So for those of you who are familiar with the Hebrew, I'm going to spell it Yud, Sin, Sin, Chaf, Resh. Yisachar. Yud, Sin, Sin. Yud, Sin, Sin, Chaf, Resh. Yisachar. I don't know if anybody in the, online has anybody in the family called Yisachar. But you may or may not know that actually, for many people, that's not the way we pronounce the name. Even though it's Yud Sin Sin with the double Sin, many times the name is pronounced Yisachar, which does not pronounce the last letter, the second Sin, excuse me. I want to explain that. Is that all? When we start talking, you can explain whether you know about that or not. So years ago in Israel, the Chazan Ish, Chazan Ish gave instructions in his own Beit Midrash to the Baal Kore. When it came to Parsha Bayetze, he insisted that the Balkore read the word, the name of the, this child, Yisachar. And then, after that, every other time that name appeared, which is not huge, but every time it did, he said, do not come out, do not pronounce it Yisachar, but he, uh, excuse me, I, I'm saying I'm saying the story incorrectly. No, I was right. He, he call it Yisachar only in Vayetze, but any other Parsha that it's read in, you have to pronounce the name Yisachar as though only one scene appeared. Why is that? If two scenes are written, then you would think if that's the way the name appears in the Torah, then why would he not deliberately read it the way it's intended? So listen to this explanation. And this explanation is derived from one of the commentaries of the Torah called Da'ad Zakin Yumi Ba'alei Tosafot. And they explain the following. That yes, Yisachar had two scenes. But a little later on in Sefer Breshit, towards the end in Parshad Vayigash, we realize, we see a list of children that were born to Yisachar. And one of the children born to Yisachar, I'm going to call it now Yisachar, is a child whose name is in three letters, Yod, Yud, Vav, Veit. Yud, Vav, Veit. That's how it's listed in the Torah. One of the children that was born was called by the name Yud, Vav, Veit. But Yisachar, who was the father, at some point was unhappy with the name given to this child, Yud, Vav, Veit. And he insisted that one of the scenes, as it were from his name, be given to this child. And so, interestingly enough, in Sefer Bimibar, Parashat Pinchas, when the Torah lists the names of the children of Yisachar, 
it lists the name, but doesn't call the son Yod, Yud, Vav, Beit, calls him Yashuv, Yud, Shin, Vav, Beit. Whoa, 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 what happened from Vayigash, where he was born, to Sefer Bimidbar, the name changes. Yes, why? Because the name Yud, Vav, Beit, apparently, was evocative of the name of an idolatrous religion at the time. So Yud Vav Veit sounded like, or was too too evocative of the name of a foreign god. Yisachar was unhappy about this, took out, as it were, uh, insisted that a, a scene be included in his son's name. And from that point on, the child's name was not Yov, but Yashu. And so therefore, the Chazon Ish said, as a result of that, Explanation of the Dada Zakeni Mibale Tosafot in the beginning uh, when Yisachar himself was born, we pronounce it Yisachar. But from that point on in the Torah, whenever the name appears, it's not pronounced Yisachar, it's always pronounced Yisachar, even though in the actual Torah it's written Yud, Sin, Sin, Kafresh. But because of this explanation, that the name was changed as indicated in the Torah itself from Parsha by Yigish to Parsha of the Midbar. So all of Baalei Kriya were instructed in the Chaz of Isha's Beit Midrash, do not pronounce the name Yisachar, but only Yisachar. And that, by the way, is what Rav Salvechik, Zechus Sadat Bracha, also did in uh, the Yeshiva and YU and wherever he was laying. He also told his, his, um, his Baalei Kriya. He said from Parsha, Vayetze to Parsha Pinchas, you read it Yisachar, but from Parsha Pinchas and on, when we see the name as Yashuv, Yud, Shin, Vavet, then he instructed his Balkori to no longer call the name Yisachar, but Yisachar. So that's an interesting minag for those who pay attention to when the Balkori reads it. So we go to Shul the Shabbos and we're listening. Let's listen, make sure that our Balkori reads it correctly. In this case, it's Yisachar. So I'm so grateful for you joining and listening. Well, I hope you're listening. <laughs> and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing some of your, your um, thoughts and comments. Please feel free to unmute yourselves. And I will try my, let's see, I got to. Uh... Oh. Rabbi Diamond. Yes. My father, Lashon, he was named Yasahar Dog. And my grandson got the name after him, who is in Israel, in Yerushalayim. And how does he pronounce his name? Yes, his name is Gidon. Gidon Yasachar. Yisachar. Yasachar, right. So, but it's but it's written, Marika, with yes. two letters. Yud, Sin, Sin. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm going to check. The name in Hebrew. I'm going to check. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. But that's why the, the pronunciation is a little different than the way it's actually written. Well, he's in Israel, Yerushalayim, so I don't know which... <laughs> Just in bar mitzvah, right? I'd be interested to hear. If you could do some homework, check please for us and let us yes. know. Okay, so you've got a homework you. assignment. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all well. Any thoughts, comments? Very interesting as usual. I, I love your insights. Thank you. We both do. We both do, yes. We both do. Even if Marty falls asleep occasionally. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's the old joke. I think I've said it before. That's why in synagogues they have pizzas. So during the rabbis, German men and women don't sleep together. So there you go. Yeah. I have his venture. Well, you're a quiet group tonight. Come on. Somebody's got to have something to say. Nothing? There's a lot of us. Hello, Rabbi Diamond. You're speaking to Ruth. I'm sorry to bother you. I'm speaking about um, Zilpa, Bilhan and Zilpa. Did they convert to Judaism? According to the Chachamim, the answer to that is yes. They did convert. Say, yeah. Same thing with same thing with Hagar. But Hagar is no problem because it was Ishmael. But before that, she was an Egyptian. She came from Egypt. Dora tells us she came right, from Egypt. Right. Yeah, but, so, but, but these two ladies, they did convert, okay? Yeah. Very interesting. There is some question about, in a whole different part of the Tanakh, about um, 
Machlon and Kilion, the, the, the sons of Elimelech, who left to go to Moab, did they marry Moabite women? Did those, did Naomi and Orpah, not Naomi, did Orpah and Ruth convert? Uh, so before they got married, after they got married, so there's some discussion about that. But the Avos, I think they, they married women who had to Whatever conversion meant, Ruth. I mean, obviously, it's not the same process that we have now. But whatever it meant then, the right. Rabbi, as far as Ruth goes, I mean, I was just thinking that that there, there's no, there was no formal conversion process when she, when she made that statement to um, Naomi that wherever you go, I'll go, your people will be my people, etc. I, I always thought that that was kind of her conversion statement. It was, it was, and in <laughs> fact, Sharon, the Gemara uses that to develop various halachas about conversion based on what Ruth actually said to Naomi. Exactly mm -hmm. that. So that was probably the sort of conversion. Center. But that led to the question uh, that we're not going to go into now. So if that was her statement of conversion, what happened when she married the boy? Like, she wasn't converted then? She converts later. Well, uh, of course. No, well, but she, she had to be, well... It would seem that if that was the conversion, then she was converted when she married Boaz. No, 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 no. that story happened after yeah. everybody's dead. That's when they're starting to go yeah, back. Yeah. I've been before. Oh, she had a husband before. Not mm. Na not Ruth. Naomi had a husband before. No, no. no. So did so did Ruth. 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 Ruth had a husband? Oh. Yeah. They, they, oh, right. One okay. Of son. That's right. That's right. So I guess he wasn't converted then. So that's it, it some of the, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's very. Right. I I totally, I totally went blank on why she was with Naomi. Okay. <laughs> the the it came up, it came up, and I just was why, and I sure I wasn't earlier this week. Um. We were discussing the what the carbon pizza and why when I came to eat, I gotta remember it correctly when I, when a when a non the non Jew could eat the organ uh, no. Right. I do could eat the cotton paste if we were the male. We had meal. Yeah, you have to be you have to be, That's right. You have to be a you have to be circumcised male in order to eat the cotton paste. No, to <laughs> the the question somebody asked the question <laughs> why is the word a female? Were there any, were there any, were there any restrictions, were there any qualifications to eat the cotton pizza? No, women could participate and, in it. The halacha about Mila obviously applied to men, but because that was true for the Jewish people, but, the, men but, to, but, the men had to, the men had to, but the, but the woman has to hard, do though. some. The men, yeah, the so, men had to undergo Mila because they hadn't undergone Mila in their oh, right. So that's why the men had to do it. The women were so able to eat it that process, obviously. Oh, Rabbi Diamond, my father's your side was Allah Shalom, a just has one eight, and it says, Yes, 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 hard so that's the way it's spelled. Yes, yes that's right. Yes, that's right. <laughs> the question okay. isn't how it's spelled, Marika. Because well, that's in English. English. We, that's in English. I have to check not the Hebrew. Yeah, I'm pretty sure in the Hebrew it would be spelled Yud Sin Sin Kaf Reish. The question is how it's going to get pronounced. So most times it's pronounced Yisachar, with Yisachar, the other right. letter being there in the writing, but not being pronounced <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. But check, check with your own family tradition and see what they know. I right. will have to check on the gravestone, the spelling, but my grandson, who is in Yerushalayim, he always calls himself Yasahar. 
Yisachar, exactly, because exactly. that's the way it's pronounced. Right. Right? Yeah. Even though two letters are there, right? Pronounced Yisachar. Exactly. Yisachar, that's right. He always says for himself, correct? Or oh, it's interesting. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you, Rabbi.